chapter 4. While you're finding your place, I might mention if you would like to do a special number during the Christmas season, please let me know. We would love to have you join us. Um, uh, and if you don't come to me, I might come to you. But we want to encourage you to join us in, in worshiping the Lord during this Christmas season. I'd like to ask you if you have your place in Galatians 4. If you would stand with me as I read the Word of God. In Galatians 4, verses 1 through 7 says, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he's master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because your son, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God. Father, Give us an appreciation for what you've done for us, an appreciation for your word. Guide us, direct us in your study, in our study of your word today. Draw us close to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Countdown to Christmas. We have a calendar. It's not really a calendar. It's a big felt Christmas tree with pockets on it. And it has 25 little pockets. It says one, two, you know, all the way up to 25. Today, what will happen is made for Cindy by her grandmother. And what we will do today is we will unpin, unpin number one. I believe it's a snowman. And we will put it on the Christmas tree. And every day in December, we will take, or probably Cindy will take, another object off, out of the pocket, until the 25th, and yeah, the 25th, there's a big Santa Claus um, that we pin on. Of course, it came from Sydney's grandma, so you understand that. But it's our countdown to Christmas. I, the other day, a guy that works at High V, he and I were talking, and it's been a couple months, and I asked him, how many days till Christmas? Bam, he told me exactly how many days till Christmas. We have our countdown for Christmas. Some young people on December 26th start looking forward to the next Christmas. Is that true? <laughs> and some parents are going, oh man, I'm glad this one's over. Um, as you think about counting down to Christmas, you wonder how long did you count down? How long did it take you to, um, to get ready for Christmas? Well, today I want to go clear back in Genesis and go through the New Testament because the scripture says in Galatians 4 verse 4 but when the fullness of the time had come God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law God promised the first Christmas way back 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden as you read in Genesis chapter 3 where we read, where um, God created man and Eve, put them in environmental protection. Just think about it. They didn't need any furnaces there. It was climate control. They didn't. Uh, they they um, uh, didn't need to worry about working for food. The food was there. They were given a job. The job was to dress and keep the garden. You ever wonder what fantastic things Adam did trimming trees and that? Eve did trimming trees. They named the animals, and they were given one command. The command said, everything in the garden you can eat but, one, but of one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Tempted by Satan, Adam and Eve plunged the whole human race in peace. But in the middle of that situation, God gave a promise. In Genesis chapter 3, the Lord said to the serpent, Because you've done this, you're cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. 
and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And it says, literally, he shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. You think about, where's the promise there? God promised that the child of a woman would destroy Satan. And we see when we get into chapter 4 that, um, that they have gone to a point of sacrifices. Even in chapter 3 where God killed animals to cover Adam and Eve and cover their nakedness. God was giving them a prelude to the sacrifice. And so we get into Genesis 4 and we see that God required a sacrifice. We see in Genesis 9 that God gave Noah a sacrifice that had to be offered up. We go to Genesis chapter 12, and we see that God said that he would bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God told Abraham, or at that time his name was Abram, that every person on the face of this earth will be blessed by your offspring. The Father promised to send a Messiah. 1700 years B.C., Abraham was given the promise. And the Old Testament prophecy gives us a line of prophetic announcement about Jesus. The Mosaic Covenant tells us that we could never uh, fulfill God's promise, but in every occasion when they sinned, they had a blood sacrifice that had to be offered up to atone for that sin, looking to the great sacrifice of Jesus. The Davidic Covenant promised the Messiah would come through his line. The Old Testament prophets all pointed to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Daniel predicted the time that Jesus would come. Micah predicted the place where he would come. Isaiah predicted what he would do. And we're going to look in depth at Isaiah today. But every Old Testament book points to Jesus. And in fact, when we read uh, concerning the resurrection with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, the scripture tells us that Jesus told them, he explained to them, from Moses and the prophets. He says, Jesus said, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. Every Old Testament points to the book. There was a countdown to the coming of the Messiah. There was a countdown to the coming of the Lord Jesus. In fact, I, I love one of my favorite persons in the Bible is Simeon. In Luke chapter 2. Remember him? They bring Jesus after his birth to the temple to be presented before the Lord. To be circumcised and presented before the Lord. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 25, the scripture says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of all the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God. And he said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. Can you imagine Simeon's day that day? Every single day is what I picture. Simeon walks into the temple. He spends time looking around. He maybe spends every day in the temple looking for Jesus. And he leaves. Not today. And he goes on home. 
God told him he wouldn't die till he saw the Messiah. And every single day, he's counting the days. He's counting down the days. And as, as he aged, he was perhaps looking forward to stepping into eternity to be with Jesus. And one day, as he was in the temple, they brought Jesus and God says, that's the one. And Simeon holds up the child and he cries out. And you can see tears pouring from his eyes. And he says, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Simeon counted down the time. And God fulfilled his promise. You think of the anxiety through the years. When is Jesus going to come? Why did God wait so long? You ever get in that mindset? Why is it taking so long for Jesus to return? You ever think about that? There, God has his purposes. Understand that Galatians chapter 4 says it came, he came when the fullness of the time had come. One of the exciting things about the birth of our Savior is that with the sin of man, God promised salvation. You know, I think that's what's wonderful about our God. He is holy and he is righteous. The Bible says he is separate from sinners. He cannot allow sin into his presence. And yet, when he condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, he promised a way of salvation. Even in his holiness, God loved us. And along with judgment, God gives grace. You imagine what love that is of our Father. In spite of our rebellion against him, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says God demonstrated his own love for us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God began the countdown the second man began to sin. But you know, the countdown began even before that. The plan of eternity, that's our last point today. I want you to think of the prophecy of Isaiah. Now, the book of Isaiah is perhaps the most important book I well you know you say what books more what what word from God is more important than any other one there is none I understand that but when you think of the books that give us the Bible in a microcosm it's the book of Isaiah Satan hates the book of Isaiah the book that is criticized the most in the Old Testament saying it's furious it couldn't be uh, couldn't have been of God it, it, God could, God people could write it, well, and you ask why? Well, all this thing that predicted. He couldn't just guess these things. And I said, that's true. You can't. It's fulfilled prophecy. You know what's exciting about Isaiah? They found a scroll hundreds of years older than any scroll that has ever been there of the book of Isaiah. It was found in the caves in Qumran. You've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I have personally seen the book of Isaiah. I could make you know, heads or tails out of it. You know, it's all written backwards in these funny letters. But as scholars studied it, to see how much of Isaiah had changed through the years, there is one word, and they don't know if the ink bled or what, one word that could be different. You understand how reliable the, the text is of the Old Testament? how reliable it is for us. Satan hates the book. He hates its prophecy because Isaiah is perhaps the most clear gospel presentation of the Old Testament that you can come up with. Isaiah prophesied the coming of Jesus 700 years before Christ. Look at Isaiah chapter 7 with me. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That tells us two things. 
first of all, that a virgin would have a baby. I understand people try to retranslate that. And they've translated it, a young woman. That's not an accurate translation. The word there is virgin. A virgin will conceive. And we get into Matthew 1 and Luke 1, and we see a virgin conceived a child and brought forth forth a son. Isaiah told us that Jesus would be born of a virgin. And one other thing, he called him Emmanuel. The translation of that? El means God. Emmanuel among us. You see, when Isaiah looked forward into prophecy through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, there's going to be a virgin. She'll have a baby. That baby will be called God with us. Listen, those who deny the deity of Christ have to throw away the book of Isaiah. We're going to see that in our next verse we look at as well. Those who deny that Jesus Christ is fully God call God a liar. here. Isaiah told us that Jesus would come of a virgin 700 years before his birth, 700 years before Bethlehem. Isaiah chapter 9 tells us more about Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David, and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah says there will come a king who will rule over the throne of David, and you're going to know him by these names. His name is Wonderful. His name is Counselor. His name is Prince of Peace. Oh, I forgot one. Mighty God. You think about that. Isaiah points to the deity of Christ. And he points to the purpose of Jesus' coming. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my friend. Peace I give. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus came to be the Prince of Peace. And the mystery of Jesus being fully God and fully man was prophesied 700 years before his birth. The countdown kept on. Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, described what Jesus would do. We're meeting at the Lord's table today. Oftentimes, especially during the Easter season, I will read as the elements are being passed out from Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 says, Who has believed our report and to whom? has the arm of the Lord been revealed. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we have seen him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All weak like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, he opened not his mouth. That's our Savior. I don't know how you can get past Isaiah 53 without looking at the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. See, the countdown came through the prophet Isaiah as he said, There will be coming a Messiah. And that Messiah will die for your sin. You know, the countdown starts even further back than that. You may, 
further back than Adam and Eve. How can that be? See, the Bible tells me that history points to one pivotal event. The fact that Jesus Christ became part of his own creation. He took upon himself the form of a human. He became totally God and totally man. And I realized that the plan began even before Adam and Eve sinned. You see, God knew we would sin. Time means nothing to the Lord. You understand that. Past and present, it's all the same to our God. And God knew that Adam and Eve would sin and would need a Savior. And the scripture tells me in 1 Peter chapter 1, when it says that we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot. Verse 20, it says, And he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world was manifest in the last time for you. Jesus' death on the cross was promised before God laid the foundation of this world. Before the angels sang in glory to God, God had already prepared for you and me the plan of redemption. Revelation 13, 8 says that all on earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, Revelation says that Jesus was slain from the very foundation of our world. That ought to get you excited to realize that Christmas countdown took place before God put the stars in space. The countdown for your salvation took place long before God separated light from darkness, created dry land, created the, the animals, created green plants, and created man. God already had the plan in place to provide for you of eternal relationship with him. You see, Christmas and subsequently the cross was planned long before you were even thought of. God has been working out this plan throughout history. You see, all events bring us to Bethlehem and eventually to Calvary. You ever notice how we date things? Now, I understand they've changed that now. B.C., and now they've gone, added an E to it. Before the common era is what they say. But you understand that B.C. means before Christ. A.D. means Annual Domini, the year of our Lord. We date our time. January 1st, 2020 is dated from the birth of our Savior. That's exciting to realize that all dates point to Bethlehem because it is the pivotal plan of history. It's the pivotal plan of eternity, and it's God reaching out through time and space, telling you and me that he loves us and he wants us to spend eternity with him in heaven. The plan to offer us salvation includes your name. Revelation, Revelation, Romans chapter 10. Just one short verse, but what a verse says this. In verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever. Now I like, there's some things I don't like about the old King James translation. You know, there's some things that are hard to understand and hard to figure out. But I love the old King James translation in Revelation, or Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Whosoever shall Call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that name, whosoever. I knew an individual whose name was whosoever, his middle name. And I think, what a beautiful name. Do you realize that salvation is offered to whoever will take it? The countdown from eternity had each one of us in mind. Our loving Heavenly Father 
has each one of our faces in his mind. The plan was to offer you an opportunity to walk with God for all eternity. And you think about, we started in Genesis, where Adam and Eve walked in fellowship with God. Christmas is about restoring that fellowship. Fellowship that was broken because of sin. Fellowship that was marred because of sin. And that today, you can have a relationship with the living God. You can have fellowship with God because Jesus came that first Christmas morning. There's coming a day when a trumpet sounds, the archangel shouts, and I won't need wings. I'm going to fly. And my fellowship with God will be unbroken for all eternity. The salvation is what Christmas is all about. It's not about gifts. It's about a gift. It's not about trees. It's about a tree. It's not about sacrifices made. It is about one sacrifice that was made. And that is Jesus giving his life for you. It is all about God's eternal plan. From eternity past, God decreed that Jesus would become part of his own creation. That Jesus would become a servant. That he would be born in a manger. That he would be born amongst all kinds of gossip in his town. That he would live a life of perfection and holiness. That he would be condemned and nailed to a cross. And that he would give his life as a ransom for you and me. And that he would cry out on that cross, it is done. It is finished. And, now, and then he rose again. That was all in God's plan. Also in God's plan is that you would respond to the gospel. Either you would say, yes, I want Jesus, or you would say, no, I don't want it. It's up to you. Christmas starts when you place your trust in Jesus as your Savior. The time clock is ticking. It won't be long before Jesus comes again and your opportunities will be over. It won't be long before you will see your last Christmas. But I want you to know today that God's eternal plan includes you if you will trust in Jesus today. And I invite you to do that. To place your trust in Christ. Today, we're going to sit around the Lord's table. We're going to remember that Jesus came to this world to give his life a ransom for us. What better time is there than this for you to simply admit that you are a sinner and that you are in need of God. And to acknowledge the fact that Jesus died for your sins. Turn from your sin to Jesus and receive him as your Savior and your Lord. And if you'll do that, it'll be the best Christmas ever. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he came. I thank you that in your eternal plan, you provide eternal salvation for us. Oh, Father, we thank you so much that Jesus came. We, re we rejoice in his coming. We, we revel in the fact that he not only came, but he lived and he died for us and he rose from the grave and he's coming again. So, Father, help us. If there's someone here without Christ, draw them to him. And for those of us who know Jesus, help us to walk with him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.